Welcome to Study Time, a televised home learning program produced by Rwanda Education Board. Hello, Senior 3 students. How are you doing? I hope you are fine and you are moving on well. Uh, I'm happy to join you again today on TV Learning Program. My name is Teacher JB, and you know I'm your physics teacher who is helping you during this uh, period of time. So I want to invite you to attend the lesson, and uh, we enjoy learning together for the next 30 minutes. And so, as you know, we are still on unit number five. It's quite a wide, a wide unit, and some people find it a bit difficult, but I hope we are, we are trying to uh, make it a bit simple. And so for today, we are still looking at unit, unit five, as I told you, but the lesson title for today is going to be different. We are going to be looking at what we call the heating and cooling curves of a substance. When you heat, at a, heat a substance, the temperature increases. And when you cool it down, the temperature goes down. So we want to look at uh, the heating and cooling curves. You see, curves which will look like this. I know this is not uh, big enough, but later on we shall see bigger diagrams, bigger graphs for the cooling curve. So that's what we want to look at uh, today. And so, very quickly, let's look at our learning objectives for today. By the end of this lesson, every one of you should be able to draw a sketch, okay? Doesn't need to be very accurate as to scale. You should be able to draw a sketch of the heating or cooling curve of a substance. Given its MP, I, I didn't have a lot, a lot of space. This is melting point, you know it well, uh, freezing point, boiling point, and condensation point. Maybe some other points for other changes in temperature, but here we are just looking at those. Okay? You should also be able to explain the main features of the heating or cooling curves. Main features. How do they look like, and how do we interpret uh, those features of the cooling and heating curves. And lastly, we should also be able to know how to, I mean where, not how, with how we already, we already know. We have been doing this before. So we should know where to apply the equation H equals ML or Q equals ML on which part of the graph. So that is our learning objectives today and I hope you, you, remember, you remember that as we move along. Now, before we get started, we want to look at the previous assignment. You remember last time I left you with some work to do, and some of them are very easy, uh, which I'm going to ignore. I'm going to concentrate on parts that I think may have given some of you some challenge. So part A, differentiate between latent heat and specific latent heat. That is quite very easy. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on that. Let me go to the next one, which is part B. The specific latent heat of fusion of water is 330 joules per gram. Express this value in joules per kilogram. I'm going to start with part B. Part A is quite easy. We have been looking at it before. You just need to revise your, your notes. So let me begin with part uh, B. Remember, this is our previous assignment. And as I said, I'm going to begin with part B. So let's read part B together. Part B says, the specific latent sheet of fusion of water is 330 joules per gram. That is specific latent heat of fusion. Remember the symbol we use for specific latent heat of fusion is L then F. So specific latent heat of fusion is 330 joules per gram. That's what they have given us. They want us to express that in joules per kilogram. So what this one means is that the amount of heat which is required by one gram is equal to 330 joules. That's what it means. You require 330 joules to change uh, one gram of uh, water from a solid state to a liquid state. That is what it means. So it is one gram, 330 joules. Okay, what about now if we need 
one kilogram. Remember in one kilogram, one kilogram is equivalent to how many grams? 1,000 grams. So you try to reason it out. If one gram requires 330, what about now one kilogram, which is 1,000 grams? So 1,000 grams will require 330 times 1,000. And in that case, we are going to get 330,000. So 330,000, this will now be in joules per watt per kilogram. And that is going to be the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So that should answer uh, part B, okay? Let's go to the next one. Part C, the specific latent heat of vaporization of mercury, okay? So specific latent heat of vaporization. I'm going to move to the other side. Specific latent heat of vaporization, we are going to use LV. Uh, it's given as 294 joules per gram, okay? Per gram, we can write it like this. You can write a stroke, but you can write that. How much heat is needed to change two kilograms? So it means mass here is uh, two kilograms. Um, to change two kilograms of mercury to gas at its boiling point, okay? So we want the amount of heat. That means we want H. Remember, they have given us boiling point as 357, but we don't need to use it here because during change of state, temperature does not change. So temperature does not feature in our equation. So we shall then say, using H is equal to MLV, this is specific latent heat of fusion. So this is going to be two kilograms, okay, times specific latent heat of vaporization. But remember, this is in joules per gram. So we need to change this into joules per kilogram. So if you change to joules per kilogram, we just multiply that by 1,000. And so if you multiply by 1,000, that is what you are going to get in joules per kilogram, just like we said in, uh, in part, uh, part B. Okay, so we just multiply that. Get your calculator. Remember what I told you, you should always be having your calculator. I'm going to try to multiply for you as well. So it is 294,000, then times two. So what do we get? 588, 588,000. And the unit of amount of heat is going to be measured in what? In joules. And so that is all about our previous assignment. Okay? So let's move ahead. Our main target today is looking at the heating curve and cooling curve. So what I'm choosing here is the heating curve for water. And why I've chosen water is because water is a very common material that we use. All of us use water. And we have all seen water in all the three states. Uh, solid state, which is uh, ice, then the liquid state, like the one that we, we drink. Maybe I should drink some water, then you can also look at the liquid state of water. Liquid state of water. You know that very well. Good. Then we also have the gaseous state of water, which is water vapor. So this kind of graph, which is a graph of temperature, you can see on the vertical axis, against amount of heat. It's not only amount of heat, it can also be against time. If you come with me to this board, it can be temperature against time. Not only amount of heat. You can have amount of heat, no problem, or also you can have time. I remember when you are representing this on a graph, uh, temperature, you must put the unit, which is degree Celsius or Kelvin. Me, I have chosen to use degree Celsius. I'm more friendly with degree Celsius. Then you have heat absorbed, which is in joules. You put a stroke, and then time, the unit is second. So we want to explain why this curve is drawn like this. Good. The key things to remember here are, one, during change of state, the temperature remains constant. The moment you see a temperature is not changing on a heating curve, then it means there is a change of what? Of state. 
If you see the temperature is changing, then the state is not changing. So those are, those are critical issues that we need to understand. Okay? So let's move to our graph here. Let me begin with this graph. If you look at this point here, is the graph, I mean, the line is flat. So that, what does it tell us? The temperature is not changing. Temperature is constant. So there's a change in state from, so, I mean, from, so, yes, from solid to liquid. And we call that melting, if you remember. Again, when you move from this point going upwards, there's no change in state because temperature is changing. But here, there's a constant temperature. That's how the heating curve is. Let us look at a more magnified diagram uh, of the heating curve. So here we have the heating curve for water. So what is the melting point of ice? It is zero degrees Celsius, which is here. And the boiling point of pure water at standard at, uh, pressure is 100 degrees Celsius. So here we are beginning with water at uh, negative 20 degree Celsius. I do not know whether you are able to see uh, that graph very well. I may have to move my laptop a little bit so you can see. Are you able to see my graph very well? Okay, I hope so. So, negative 20 to zero. Now, from negative 20 to zero, the state of matter which we have here is solid, okay? Solid, because this is solid ice. Then, from B to C, you can see from B to C, temperature is not changing. Why? Because this ice is now melting. Remember, it is absorbing some heat. The heat from B to C is being used to melt the ice. So from B to C, that is melting. And from this, we can easily see that the melting point of this water is, uh, of course, ice is zero degree Celsius. Again, I want you to look at the length from B to C. We shall talk about that as well. Then, from C to D, it means all the ice has now melted. Remember the beginning point. Ice begins to melt from, C, from B. And at C, all the ice has finished what? Melting. So it means at point, after point C, we don't have any solid water. We have liquid water. So from C up to D, this is now liquid water, like the one that I've just been drinking some minutes before. Then at D, ice, I mean water now begins to boil. So from D to E, we are now having both liquid water and gaseous water, from D up to E. And after E, we are now going to have water in a vapor form. So that is how the heating curve looks like. So if you know the melting point the, and the boiling point of a substance, you can very well draw your heating curve very easily. Okay? So let's look at the next graph. The next graph, which is still talking about the heating curve, remember that is our main focus today, uh, is the phase change. Remember last time we talked about phase, and phase means state. Okay? State. So phase change uh, graph for water. So you can see uh, this is solid. As you can see, the, the solid lattice structure, they are close to each other. And then from solid, it changes into a liquid at a certain temperature, which is called a melting point. If you are moving in the opposite direction, that would be called freezing. So for us, we are following the red line. And this red line here is about heating. So this is a melting point. And then here we have a liquid. And the liquid is heated until it reaches 100 degrees Celsius. You can see against that. And here it is boiling. And so we have the boiling point of water as 100 degrees Celsius. And after this, we have a gas. Now, even if I don't take you to cooling curve, if you are looking at this very well, you should be able to construct a cooling curve. Because a cooling curve, you move now from this. You move like this as you reduce the temperature. But then, the shape won't be like this. The gradient won't be positive. The gradient will be negative. So you'll begin moving from here, then you move like this. That will be the heating curve. But 
we are going to look at uh, such a curve uh, shortly. Okay, I hope you are following that as well. Then the next one is the combined curves. If you have got both the cooling curve and heating curve of water, you see? Both of them are here. So what do you think is the name of this curve? Heating curve or cooling curve? According to me, it is heating curve. Why? Because as we move along the graph, the temperature is increasing. This is a cooling curve. Because as we move along the graph, the temperature is doing what? Decreasing. You're beginning from steam, you come to liquid water in a glass, which you can drink, and then you come to ice. So this is the cooling curve. So do you then see that the heating curve is the opposite of the cooling curve? Yes, because heating is the reverse of what? Of cooling. Okay? So think about that. That should be quite easy for you to appreciate. Now, the next item we want to look at, the next concept, is that many times people draw this graph wrongly. They sketch it wrongly. And this is very important. That is what I want to explain. Okay? If you look at the length of this line from B to C, look at that length from B to C. It is, it is small. But when you look at the length from D to E, it's longer. Why is D E longer than B C? Two. If you look at the steepness, your math teacher, if you have been following what he has been teaching you, he told you about gradient. So if you look at the gradient, you know, gradient of this line A B, do you think it is the same as the gradient of the line C D? No. This one is steeper. A, B, steeper. And then C, D is less steep. And actually, E, F is the steepest of all. So why do we have to draw those graphs like that? So this is the reasoning. And I hope you are going to follow it very nicely. This is the reasoning. Let's look at the next slide. If we compare, in this slide, if we compare the specific latent heat of ice, which is latent heat of fusion, and also uh, the specific latent heat of steam, which is latent heat of vaporization. They don't have the same value. They don't. The specific latent heat of steam, okay, the specific latent heat of, uh, yes, of steam is two millions 260,000 joules per kilogram. I'm going to make it clearer this side. So you'll come over this side. Okay. So imagine in the whole of this arrangement, we are heating one kilogram of water. That's what we are concentrating on. One kilogram of what? Of water. So what does it mean? Let me start from B to C. From B to C. Remember it is one kilogram. So if you apply your formula, H is equal to ML. M is one kilogram. And L is 2,260,000 joules. So what does it mean? It means that uh, from D to E, from D up to E, what amount of heat is going to be absorbed by one kilogram of, uh, of, of, of water? It is going to be 2,260,000 joules. That is from D to E. Now, compare that with from B to C. B to C, we are looking at specific uh, latent heat of, uh, of, of fusion of ice. So from B to C, for one kilogram, we are going to have 330,000 joules. Do you look at that? So ice requires only 330,000 joules to convert one kilogram into liquid water. But what about uh, water which is at 100 to change into steam? Does it require also 330,000 joules? No. It requires 2,260,000 joules. 
If you do a quick arithmetic, you will find uh, it's about six times the amount of water required, I mean heat required to make water uh, boil at 100 is almost six times that which is required to make ice to melt. That's why you see when you hold ice in your hand, that ice will melt faster than water would boil in a, in a saucepan. Okay? And so when it comes to drawing the graph, because this one takes more, I mean less time, remember less heat here, this one takes less time and this one takes more time, this line is longer than line BC. So that is the reason. Again, when you look at specific latent heat, uh, I mean specific heat capacity of ice, specific heat capacity, let me write it here, specific heat capacity of ice is 2,100 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Then specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin or per degree Celsius. So if you look at this, from negative 20 up to zero, change in temperature is 20. Again, if we get 20 degrees here, this is ice changing its temperature by 20, and this is liquid water changing its temperature also by what? By 20. So if you work out the amount of heat required here for one kilogram to raise the temperature of ice from negative 20 to zero is going to be equal to M, which is one, times C, which is 2,100, then times 20. And if you multiply that, I'm sure you are going to come out with 42,000 joules. You see? Then, when you look at this, the amount of heat here required is M, which is 1, times C, which is 4,200, times theta, which is 20. And if you multiply this by 20, it is going to be 84,000 joules. So what does it mean? You need less heat to make the temperature of ice to increase. And you need more heat to make the temperature of water to do what? To increase. That is why this one will take more time to heat. Liquid water takes more time. So the, the line will have a smaller gradient, so it is less steep. This one takes a very short period of time, and that's why the gradient is very steep. So I hope you are able to follow that very nicely. So coming back to what we said, you see, if this amount of heat required to make water to boil, this is for uh, what is required to make ice to melt. You can see, they are not, diff they are not the same. This is almost, this one, is almost six times the other one. And so that's what we are saying. Okay, looking at the next one, we are comparing also heat capacities of ice and water. That is what we have been doing here, okay? They are not the same. You require only 2,100 joules of heat to make the temperature of ice to increase by one degree Celsius. And yet, for liquid water, you require 4,200 joules. And so if you take one degree, I mean, you take increase by 20 degrees Celsius, this one, ice will require 42,000, and then water will require 48,000. So this requires more heat. And that explains the shape of those graphs. Okay? And so very quickly, we shall have one activity that we are going to do, and then we shall go to our assignment, possibly. So allow me to clear off this, this part. Okay, let me clear off this part. Let me clear off that part. In the meantime, you should be reading the assignment, I mean, the activity, because we need to interpret it together, okay? Make sure you are reading the activity. Okay, so let's, let's go through the activity. I'm going to read it for you. And uh, I hope you're also going to read it as well. An electric heater, remember changes electric energy into heat energy, is connected to a 220 volts mains electricity. So what does it mean? It means that V is equal to 220 volts. Me, I want to organize my work like this. Um, a current of 4.4, I mean 5.45, and current, remember the symbol is I, so 4.545 amperes is connected so that it flows through the heating element of the heater. This heater is used to melt 2.5 kilograms. Now, what is 2.5 kilograms? To me, it is 
the mass. So the mass is 2.5 kilograms. Okay? Uh, to melt ethanol at negative 114 degrees Celsius. Now, because we are talking of melting, there's no need for us to consider the temperature, okay? They are just giving us information, but we shall not use this because we are only looking at melting. Uh, so it, 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 use, it is used to melt the ice. So they're telling, I mean, the ethanol. They're telling us, how long does this heater take? So when they talk of how long, what does it tell you? They are asking us to get what? Time. So how long does it take to melt ice? And the specific latent heat of fusion of ethanol is given as 1.09 times 10 to power 5 kilograms, sorry, joules per kilogram. So they want us to get uh, uh, time. So if you remember, we said the amount of heat produced by an electric heater is given as VIT. So this VIT should be equal to MLF, because amount of heat given by the heater is what is used to melt uh, the ethanol. So for us, we want to get time. So we divide this by VI, divide that also by VI. That cancels. So it means time is going to be mass, which is 2.5, times specific latent heat of fusion, which is 1.09 times 10 to power 5 out of uh, VI. Our V is uh, 220 then times current, which is 4.545. And so let us get that time there. I'm going to press it very quickly. I hope you are pressing it as well. So you have 2.5 times 1.09, then exponent 5, okay, divided by 220, then 4.5. 545, okay? My answer is 272.5. And what is the unit of time? The unit of time has to be seconds, okay? So I believe you have followed that. So members, as I told you before, uh, remember our objective was being able to sketch the heating curve and the cooling curve of a substance, we have done that, and being able to know where to apply them. And as you can see from this graph, at this point here, we apply H equals ML. Even here, we apply H equals ML, remember? But here, when temperature is changing, we apply H equals MC theta. Even here, when the temperature is changing, we also apply H equals MC theta. So I hope we have met all our objectives. So I want to thank you so much for being attentive. And now I'm going to leave you with an assignment that you can follow. Very easy numbers. Stay safe until we meet next time. Bye-bye.